Good morning, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> As we continue our study in Judges 8, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his blessing and strength for this day? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, as we open your word before us, we see more and more our great need of you. It is from you that all blessings come. It is from you that our strength and our wisdom are derived. Help us as we open this word. Direct us today as we study together. May our minds be open to consider thoughts, to consider things that we have not seen before in these examples that are going to be us. Help us now. I thank you for each one that are choosing to set time aside for these studies this morning. I thank you for those that will listen later. Help us each now to consider carefully the examples that will be before us and help us that these may be applied within our lives and within the movement with all that is ongoing. We have need of your angels. We have great need of your spirit. We ask, Father, that they be sent so that our minds may be clear and focused upon that which we need to understand for this time in Earth's history. Be with us now. Direct us, we ask. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now. As we were wrapping some things up yesterday, we had before us that Gideon took the elders of the city of Sukkoth and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Sukkoth, or he made to know the men of Sukkoth. These are the men that refused. Gideon's request to provide bread for the army. Now we understand that the bread was to sustain the body, but what is the symbol of the bread that the men of Sukkoth withheld? Christ, the bread of life. Okay, we can apply it as Christ, the bread of life, but <clears throat> why are the men of Sukkoth choosing to withhold this from Gideon's army? Don't they understand? To compare to the mainstream, if we compare it to the mainstream church, it's like they look at us as, a, as an offshoot and persona non grata almost <laughs> in okay. some cases. <clears throat> well, we were applying this initially with the Midianites as being more the mainstream church. What do the men of Sukkoth represent if the Midianites are the mainstream church? Is it possible they could be then, if they're not the mainstream church, other so-called independent ministries? Well, the men of Sukkoth were part of the area that Gideon called when he went 
against the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the children of the East. Now, we have made the application, figuratively, of the Midianites being the corporate church. Would we then look that the Amalekites would be the Protestants, and that the children of the East, of course, being Islam? If that's the case, would then this, with the men of Sukkoth and the men of Penuel, the men of the face of God, have had something to do with the movement, but these are the ones that are choosing not to accept Gideon's leadership or to accept Gideon's message. Yeah, so I would take that that latter um, interpretation as probably the most likely correct. That the men of Sukkoth had something to do with the movement at some point, but they choose not to accept the message. Yeah. Okay. Now we come here again, where Gideon beats down the tower of the face of God and slew the men of the city. So he slew, he slays the men of Penuel and is a figure. Doesn't this message slay those that had been the closest within FFA? Yeah, and, and of course the verse in reverse is July 18. Okay. How do, how do we show that? Well, 718, 817. Right. Yeah. So, so, so we have specifically the message of July 18th that um, is in opposition to these men of Peniel. Well, this, this is why the symbolism is so, so powerful. Mm -hmm. Because It is not Elder Jeff that stood against the message of July 18th mm -hmm. or the message that came subsequent to July 18th. Correct. So when the, when the tower is beaten down, the tower of the face of God, The symbol is showing that those that are, to me, that this is an opinion. So feel free to disagree with it. But it's, it's like saying that the, the leadership that rejected the message of July 18th is now being set aside. Mm hmm Now, as we pick up the study where we left off yesterday, then said he, then said Gideon unto Zeba and Zalmunna, what manner of men were they whom ye slew at Tabor? And they answered, as thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king or each one were according to the form of the children of a king. When we look at this portion, when we look at this verse, Zeba and Zalmunna are recognizing that those that they slew we're presenting before them the character of a king. Why is this important for us to know?
Well, I'm not sure if I understand exactly what this verse is talking about, what it's referring to. Because at Mount Tabor, um, so who are they talking about that they slew? Well, Mount Tabor. So that's Judges chapter 4. Right. But we're also speaking here of what was occurring before during the time of Deborah and Barak. Yeah, right. So it's, yeah, Judges 4 during Deborah and Barak. Now, when we're looking at this with Tabor, Tabor is seen as being, according to its translation, a broken region. Yeah. So Zeba and Zalmuna took part in the attack that led to the victory of Deborah and Barak. Hmm. How would you see this? Because Gideon's asking the question, what sort of men were these? Okay, so so Gideon conquers Zeba and Zamuna, and they right. were also at Mount Tabor in the story of Deborah and Barak. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, because that's what he's asking them. And so they are going to have killed some of those of the 10,000 that came uh, in that battle. Bless you. So some of the 10,000 that came in that battle, is that what that's talking about? I would have to assume so. Okay. Yeah, just it's just kind of to me it's odd that it jumps out here. Um Okay, so I'm not sure how to how to make sense out of this. Well, <clears throat> okay. We've got in in this prior to the emergence of Deborah and Barak we have Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, who's the captain of whose host was Sisera. Mm -hmm. Now, we have the command where Deborah gives the advice in Judges 4, 6, and she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and the children of Zebulun? Right. So, so this is saying then, in Judges 8, 18, that, um, so Gideon's asking them, so, so he's saying that they were there, I mean, at that battle at Mount Tabor. Exactly. Okay. But um, I guess he would have known that for some reason that the Bible doesn't show other than here. This is the first we hear of it, that they were there. So... So Zeba and Zalmuna, we're taking as being, of course, not people in the movement or anything like that. This is some kind of message. Right. And so this is going back to the story, which we have understood has to do with Parminder. Right. So that means Zeba and Zalmuna here, who are going to be conquered by Gideon. Right. 
there are people in the movement or there's a part of the movement, whatever you want to look at it, that doesn't support them in going to capture them. Right? So there is some, some error that has been dogging the movement, let's say, um, that now is going to be addressed by this July 18th prediction. Right. And, and that, that error had been responsible for slaying some of those that were supportive of the opposition uh, towards Parminder's error. Does that make sense? I didn't say very well, but maybe but somebody... It's got good. a level of logic to it. Okay. So, I mean, this is still a continuation of this. So Gideon's message, though, is the message after July 18th. But it's connected to July 18th. Very definitely. And so what could we say was the message after July 18th? I mean, what happened after July 18th? Um, specifically, um, that would be related to a message that we could line up with Gideon. I mean, what, what was the error? What is the message? Neither Sukoth nor Penuel wish to offer any of their bread. Mm -hmm. Which really, really would be uh, assistance or support. There you go. In this context. I mean, from my perspective, just from a, a plain, you know, understanding of what's happened since July 18th. Definitely the work that's being done in these studies has not been supported by uh, either the American group or the Canadian group. Zeba and Zalmuna. Yeah. So, I mean, it could represent that, but that's a pretty direct sort of application. Well, at this point, I think we're going to have to look at this in a direct manner. And then if anyone else has some other recommendations or suggestions, then let's consider those as well. Mm -hmm. But at this point, we have the men of Penuel, we have the, the elders of Sukoth, have refused sustenance, have refused support. Now we have Ziba and Zamuna being identified, being revealed as having been at Mount Tabor. But in this case, they would end up being the enemies that were that existed because these are messages but you know we're saying okay it's the american and canadian group i don't know if we can make that application but we were taking them as messages that it existed um during parminder's apostasy okay so let's of the messages that existed during parminder's apostasy one of those messages is that you should not trust certain people well yeah i mean th th that's definitely true but it's also uh, i would look at it as the opposition to uh the use of numbers so they would categorize the way that we were using numbers as numerology or something like that some kind of magic correct um so there was opposition to uh July 18th and all the ways. So even though they use numbers to a point, at a certain point they just stopped and then they eventually rejected the entire use of numbers. Right? So they wanted to use them for the November 9th, 2019 prediction, but nothing beyond that. And even after that, it, it seems that they've rejected that. I mean, their, their basic time setting, they've, they seem to have rejected. Uh, it just seems kind of odd, but um, 
But I would say the part of the, the thing that, because if you're dealing with Zalmuna, which means um, uh, shade, shade has been denied, right? So uh, the rejection of any kind of support. Um, I mean, I still think it's this this attack of, as you're saying, the attack of individuals. But it's just that anything that did not come from Parminder and Tess was just dismissed. But we saw that the seed that they had planted still continued. That is, many people still took the same position that Parminder and Tess had held, even though they continued in the movement. That is, people rejected the symbolic use of numbers. Um, I, I don't know. I just don't know how we get Ziva and Zomuna because these are part of the enemy, right? So this is part of the enemy. But you also have Sukkoth and Penuel as, as they're not part of the enemy, but they're not supporting the message. So in a sense, uh, Sukkoth and Penuel are tied to Ziba and Zamuna. No, I'm. No, they're two different groups. They're still tied to the same symbol. Aren't Ziba and Zamuna considered as princes of the Midianites? Yeah. So, Ziba and Zamuna can be interrelated with Parminder and Tess. Right. But they also have to be interrelated then with the corporate church. Well. The messages. Yeah, the messages. I mean, we can see that definitely that the message of Parminder and Tess is the message of liberal Adventism. Okay. But we also have Sakuth and Penuel. Right. So in a sense, Sakuth and Penuel represent these two groups, just like Ziba and Zamuna do. And really, they're the same thing. In the sense that they're the same message. By rejecting. Because if we look at what Zamuna means, which means to basically deny shade, right? Correct. That's exactly what Sukkoth and Penuel did. So Ziba and Zamuna, the symbols of them are reflected in the actions of Sukkoth and Penuel. Does that make sense? That they're parallel to each other. They're an illustration of the same thing. One looks internal, Sukkoth and Penuel. The other one looks external in a sense. But they're in perfect agreement with each other. By not supporting the attack on this message, this, this false message of Parminder's, you're actually partaking in it. All right. Uh, I don't know if anybody has another way to express it. Well, we know there's no ne neutrality. Yeah, what's the statement in the spirit of prophecy regarding neutrality? I don't know it by heart, but I've read it a few times. Yeah, I, I just can't think of how it's worded. Yeah, she's very emphatic. There is no neutrality. And basically, I mean, if you're not standing for truth, you're standing for falsehood. Yeah, but there's a famous statement. Jeff would always quote it. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> about a crisis or something like that. I can't remember the statement. Somebody must remember it. Well, maybe maybe somebody can find it in you know in the next day or so. Yeah.
So why is it necessary for us to view what Zeba and Zelmuna have done, noting that those that they slew at Tabor were according to the form of the children of a king. Is this saying that the message that they destroyed or that they set aside at Mount, at Mount Tabor was a message from God? Well, yeah. Um. So Gideon continues, and he said, they were my brethren, even the sons of my mother, as the Lord liveth, if he had saved them alive, I would not slay you. So Gideon is recognizing those that were at Tabor were part of a righteous message. Mm -hmm. And that Zeba and Zalmunna, being part of the Midianites, rejected a message that they should have accepted. Mm -hmm. Now, the messages that we have seen that have been rejected primarily have had in, have had to do with the seven times and now with July 18th. Mm -hmm. and, and the way that the method messages were rejected was never, no one ever went through a logical understanding of things. That's the thing that bothered me the most always. Whenever I see somebody reject something, but they never actually address the points being made, or if they do, they take them out of context and distort them, right? They twist the words of the person who's presenting something, um, you know, taking out of it its actual meaning or significance. So one of the things we saw with uh, the December 6th declaration is a complete rejection of the arguments that I was making about July 18th and about time setting. And um, in order to, to attack what we were doing, they basically, first they had to attack the person, but they also had to completely ignore all of the arguments. They had to set up straw man arguments and attack those. But also in doing so, they were shooting themselves in, the own, in, their, own, in their own foot. They're shooting themselves in the foot because uh, they ended up having to reject basically the entire message that Jeff had given ever, ever since he began presenting. So they were condemning themselves All right, any other examples or thoughts? Gideon is saying to them, he is going to slay them. He is going to put an end to their message. Okay, now in the chat, there's a comment. I'm not sure I understand it. What the five Bible comment SDA Bible commentary, right? Yeah, so that's just uh, I think she's probably uh, referring put re, having us look at page a uh, thousand and ninety three. 
Yeah, I have it here. I had to open up my, my other computer. It says, uh, Christ shows that there can be no such thing as neutrality in his service. The soul must be satisfied with, must not be satisfied with anything short of entire consecration. Consecration of thought, voice, spirit, and every organ of mind and body. It is not enough that the vessel be emptied. It must be filled with the grace of Christ. So she's commenting on Luke 11. And yeah, it just shows how dis yes. despicable self-righteousness yeah. is. Well, the I mean, there's a whole bunch of quotes. We could probably go through them all, but some of them. The quote that I'm thinking comes from uh, Third Testimonies. Okay. It's the one that says indifference and neutrality in a religious crisis is regarded of God as a grievous crime and equal to the very worst type of hostility toward God. All right. So the, the whole paragraph starts. What astonishing deception and fearful blindness had like a dark cloud covered itself or, or covered Israel, pardon me. This blindness and apostasy had not closed about them suddenly. It had come upon them gradually, as they had not heeded the word of reproof and warning, which the Lord had sent to them because of their pride and their sins. And now, in this fearful crisis, in the presence of the idolatrous priest and the apostate king, they remain neutral. If God abhors one sin above another, of which his people are guilty, it is doing nothing in case of an emergency, yeah. difference in neutrality this crisis is regarded of God as a grievous crime and equal to the very worst type of hostility against God. So that's the one I'm thinking of. And this is dealing with, of course, Elijah, right, at... Uh, um, Carmel? Yeah, Mount Carmel here. So... So about 3T what? Uh, page, uh, it starts on page 280. It's the last okay, paragraph, 280. But yeah, so that's the one that Jeff had always quoted. And and this is part of what, what I've seen in that there are people who say, well, I understand what's happening. I see how you're being treated, but I'm not going to stand with you. I've had that basically stated to me uh, because they believe they would lose their influence in so doing. Well, that's just plain cowardice. And Jesus said, if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. So if they're trying to save some cloak of whatever, they're going to be bereft. And I think, you know, when it says deprived of shade or de denied of shade, I'm thinking of their spiritual condition more than what they're denying to anybody else who's in need of help. Well, since you've brought this, this manuscript up, a thought and a recommendation. I'm gonna to read to you paragraph number six. And I think this goes very much in line with what we're, what we're looking at right now, symbolically within this in Judges. Every person enlightened by the truth must represent Christ. He is to be formed within the hope of glory. Man cannot accept the righteousness of Christ to be a living, abiding principle in the soul unless it transforms the entire character. He must eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God, which is eternal life to all who receive it. Those who are convinced that Jesus is the Christ and are converted to God must understand that they are to use all their powers in cooperating with their Redeemer. They are to wear his yoke. The man in whose heart Christ is abiding by faith must understand that he is privileged in being such in such blessed companionship. Now, in this point, those that would choose not to stand with a brother or a sister that is taking a position that others may find as untenable without investigating 
this position are not showing the character of Christ. They are taking the name of Christ in vain. If you break one commandment, you break them all. The situation that we're dealing with here, as far as this message, as far as these examples here in Judges 8, we have a, a group of symbolic messages, whether they came from Parminder and Tess, whether they came from the church itself, whether they came from others in the movement. We have been observing <clears throat> that first, the church chose that anything that was coming through Future for America should be set aside because they weren't agreeing with the positions that were being taken. <clears throat> now we have, we have the situation with Parminder and Tess as being representative of the liberal side of the corporate church. Now we have those that have been in the movement, the men of Penuel, the men of Sukkoth, that are also choosing not to provide sustenance symbolically withholding their support. Years ago, <clears throat> there were quite a number of presentations that Dwayne Dewey gave. The Desolation of Jerusal Jerusalem. Specific yes, specifically. Yeah. That were very much on point. But Toward the end of his life, he had rejected the positions that, that Elder Jeff was taking. Mm -hmm. He did a series of presentations to show that, <clears throat> in his mind, Elder Jeff was in the wrong. And that the message was not a correct message. He withheld his support. Mm -hmm. There are other examples of this and of these types of messages that we can apply in this situation, whether it be of that of Penuel or if it be that of Sukkoth. Yeah, well, I mean, Dwayne Dewey's situations are rather complicated because in some ways he was correct. So he, but I think for the wrong reasons. That is, to a large degree, it was more jealousy on his part. Me judging another person's motives, of course, doesn't mean anything. But, um, I mean, he knew that Parminder was teaching a wrong message, but I don't think Dwayne went about it in the correct way. That is, a lot of it was sort of done behind the scenes rather than directly. And which I think is the big problem. So we may think that some somebody's in error, but if we're going to address error, we need to be do it openly and not in some covert manner. That is, we can't gather people around us and um you know, work behind the scenes to try to undo error. Right. It has to be addressed directly. And I, I think, and I think that that was the mistake that was being done just from my human perspective and limited understanding um, with Dwayne Dewey and uh, Tanya Beeman in their opposition to Parminder, that this should have been done differently. But, you know, that's just me looking at it from the outside, not knowing what actually went on. But uh, I think the results, the fruit of what occurred, 
uh, I think would be a testimony to that fact. That is, if a person is is doing things for the right reason, they would act differently than if they're doing things for the wrong reason. You can do right things for the wrong reason. You can take the correct position for the wrong reason. So it's something we always have to be careful about. We can be in the right, but we can be all wrong. So it's just, uh, but there's something here too when we look at these next verses that we would have to understand in this right. context. So as we look at verse 820, <clears throat> and he said unto Jether his firstborn, up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared, because he was yet a youth. Jether could not stand up to the message. Mm -hmm. Now, the meaning of Jether is what? Um, let's hang on. Well, it would be um, either abundance. Why would why would Strong's connect Jether with Jethro? Well, because they're they're related. I mean, it's the would we apply the meaning of Jethro to that of Jether. I mean, and my understanding has always been that Jethro is the friend of God. Uh, means his excellence. Okay. That's what Jethro means. <laughs> and and Jether means abundance or excellency. So it just doesn't, it just is a different form of the same word just doesn't have the personal pronoun attached to it. So Gideon, who is leading the army, tells his son to stand up to the message, to the message of Ziba and Zalmunna. Yeah. And he cannot. He cannot draw the sword, for he is yet a youth. Mm -hmm. because he feared. I don't want to stand up to a message because I don't feel that I'm qualified. Mm -hmm. Have we ever heard that before? Mm -hmm. Have we ever observed that before? Lots of times. So what within this examination, to what could we apply Jether? I don't know specifically, I mean, but it would be just in a general sense, those who are uncertain really about what, I mean, their authority to, to stand up to the leadership or whatever you want to call it, that they see to a message that even if they see something wrong with it, they just don't feel that they're able to, to stand against it. don't know specifically. Is Jether having trouble standing up to those that oppose the message of July 18th? Yeah. And one of the things is, of course, 
the people who are posing the message of July 18th presently in the movement don't do so openly or directly. That is, they don't have arguments against it. They generally attack the individuals, right? I mean, I mean, personally, you, you could see what happened with me. Nobody's ever going to discuss with me or try to have a discussion about these points. Instead, they're going to get upset when I ask questions. And then they're going to mock and misrepresent things that I've said and done and misrepresent me as a person. And so people are fearful to stand up against them because the same thing would happen to them for one. Right? People are, are, are fearful about taking sides, so to speak, not that there should be sides to take. But they're fearful of standing up for the truth because one is they are a little bit uncertain about it. Because it's not something that's open and clear cut. So I think that would be part of it. And that was part of the problem with Parminder's message too, is even though we could see problems with it, it wasn't clear cut. It was done in, in a subtle way. There was a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes that we knew nothing about. Because the message of Ziba and Zalmuna is a deceptive message. Right. It's a message that takes people away from the main message, from the correct message. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, we know also from the next verse that these ornaments that are about the camel's necks are these moon, moon symbols, these crescents. Right? Okay, so let's, let's read this. Yeah. Then Zeba and Zalmunna said, Rise thou and fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength. So the message is saying... If you're stronger than we are, and we recognize that the message is correct, then the message we have presented must go away. And Gideon arose and slew Zeba and Zamuna and took away the ornaments that were on their camel's necks. And the alternate reading shows that to be ornaments like the moon. So what do we see here? What other items can we see here? Well, I'm not sure why Zeba and Zamuna uh, ask to be slain. Um, I'm not sure what that symbol means. If that's what they're asking. Well, it's well, kind maybe of challenging. I don't know. It's interesting because the um, Hebrew number that is used there for the ornament is 7720. Yeah. It's a round pendant for the neck. It's a round tire like the moon. Mm -hmm. Or even like a crescent as well, some of the translations give. Why would they, why would one call it like a crescent and the other a, a round ornament? Well, because the crescent is round. It, it's curved, right? It's curved. I, I agree with That's you. The there. idea it doesn't mean it's a circle. It's it's round like the moon. The moon is a crescent. So that that's the idea. Okay. So 
the messages recognize, the messages that have been presented, it's recognizing that those messages must soon end. Okay. For as the man is, so is his strength. So they're stating something true in this case. Right. But here again, Gebura is a feminine passive participle, which is the same as Hebrew 1368. Which, which word is that? Gebura, Hebrew 1369 strength oh okay so if this is spoken in the feminine is this not a religious message or a message of with religious overtones i don't know why do you always do that when it's in the feminine i mean words are going to be in the masculine or feminine based upon their because in English, the the feminine and masculine are, are fairly cut and dried. Mm -hmm. In Hebrew, it's not so cut and dried. Well, it depends on the type of word. Right. St it does. Strength, strength is a feminine word. <clears throat> but this is talking about his strength, which is masculine. Okay, but why is it saying his strength? masculine followed by a feminine passive participle because the word strength is feminine would this well, then i wouldn't i wouldn't make anything of it is all i'm saying in that sense it's not a word that it's choosing to be feminine for some particular reason it's always going to be feminine Okay, <clears throat> so Gideon arises and he slays Zeba and Zalmunna. And he takes away these ornaments that were on the camel's necks. Why is it important for us to understand that Zeba and Zalmunna recognize the correctness of this message and that the message then removes the symbols that are being shown as being the ornaments i mean the camels were part of the economy of the midianites and of the children of the East. So if you're taking away the ornaments, are you taking away part of the representation of the Midianites and the children of the East? What are you removing? It's almost like removing a trademark in a sense, like they're identifying marks. What, what comes to me is uh, Revelation 6.16 too, said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Like they're, they're admitting your message is correct, but we can't accept it or we refuse to accept it. So play us. Like we just can't, can't accept that because we've been inculcated with so much trash. Yeah. Well, the word they're taken as they trans translated as uh, removed or took away, I guess, here. Um, that word means to fetch, lay hold of, or seize. So it doesn't really mean to take away in the sense that um, 
we've had other words that mean take away. This one means to get, fetch, lay hold of, or seize. Um, and also just dealing with that, uh, uh, the word strength there, it's actually the strength of a man is how you would translate it literally, not his strength. Um, that is, it actually has the word uh, man, um, and then, then it has the word strength, which is in the female singular now. You know, a verse that comes to me too is the wealth of the sinner is laid up for, for the just. I don't know how it connects exactly, but that's what I'm thinking of. Right. <clears throat> what other thoughts do we have here? The next subject break is Judges 8.22. Mm -hmm. And the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. Okay, we'll just go back to, to what we were talking about, dealing with the ornaments. Okay. The ornaments which represent the moon would represent... Uh, the calendars and the time, oh, right? Okay. So, so these are, in some ways, being used by Ziba and Zamuna. In that, they they were using time, right? Corminder and Tess had time as part of their message, but these are now going to be seized by Gideon. Okay. Right, which which I would say is is not going to be used correctly because Parminder and Tess were using their time in a deceitful way. So that's that's what I understand, and of course the camels. Uh, this is going to be referred to the this the story of Islam, right? And the moon itself also is not. I would agree. Yeah. Okay. So I just thought we should finish that off. It would not. I don't. I don't think it would be out of line to look at it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, just a, another thought here. So one of the things, obviously, we know that Islam didn't attack Nashville. Right. But to some degree, the movement has has ignored Islam. That is, when we're looking at all the things that's happening and all the different types of studies, um, the movement isn't particularly interested in discussing the point of Islam, its role. Right. It sort of seems to have uh, just faded in, into uh, the darkness, so to speak. Um, so, you know, we're not talking about Islam and Bible prophecy very much in this movement that I see. Um, but we can't we can't ignore it because that symbol continues to be there. And there was. Um, you know, a question I had asked in, in a study, and uh, I don't know if it was yesterday's study, I think it was, but anyway, uh, was commented on by Pat, in, so you'll see it in, um, maybe it's Friday night study, and, and Pat commented on it. And, you know, like, what is the crisis that's going to happen that's going to change things? I still think it's going to be Islam, not just some economic crash. 
that Islam is going to become a part of of these end time events again. However, that that comes about, whether it is a nuclear attack, such as we predicted with with Nashville, or some other way. But Islam in in the news definitely has disappeared to a large degree. And so people who are just looking at the news, they're, they're focused on the pandemic and all these different things, but are neglecting a, a major part of our message, which has to do with Islam. And as we understood before, Midnight and the Midnight Cry address Islam in, in the line dealing with, with uh, the Levites. So just a thought there. Okay. So now we're going to come to this different section dealing with Gideon's ephod. Right. Which, which you know, we've studied before. I don't think we even really came to understand it, how it fit in. Well, let's understand the basis before we get to this with the ephod. Okay. The men of Israel, those of the movement, said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. Now, we studied earlier in the last books the last chapters of this book, the situation where a priest is set up that was not a Levite. Mm -hmm. Gideon is being offered the kingship. He is being offered to become the ruler of Israel. Mm -hmm. Not northern, not southern, but Israel, but we know that coming from the tribe of Manasseh, that you could have Gad, you could have Manasseh, you could have Reuben, you could have Ephraim, you could have others joining in this situation. Mm -hmm. So those of the movement have said unto the message represented by Gideon, rule thou over us. For thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. You have established us separately from the church. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Mm -hmm. I keep looking at this as Miller's rules. Okay. Yeah, so so you interpret this then as people are looking to some authority to guide them, but Gideon is saying you got to follow Miller's rules. Well, since we're we're applying this as messages and not people right the only way that we're going to be able to deal with this as a message is to look at the message that came at the very beginning and that's miller's rules mm -hmm. and that miller's rules should be part of our method and manner of study it should be the message that we are holding on to, to truly come to an understanding of what the gospel really means. Because it would be through the application of Miller's rules that we would come to a full understanding of the first, second, and third angel's message and the message 
of the other angel. Now, does anyone have a problem with that statement? Okay, so we know that, that Gideon represents a message. Right. But there's going to be a part of the message of July 18th that is going to go astray. Right. Right. Because that's what we're going to see happen here. We'll go on. Well, and Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you that ye would give me every man the earrings of his prey, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. The Amalekites are not Ishmaelites. The Midianites are not Ishmaelites. The children of the East could very definitely be Ishmaelites. Do you see a different manner of approaching this? Well, because this is the first introduction specifically of the Ishmaelites. Right, so you're going to have the Ishmaelites mentioned here, whether it's literally they are Ishmaelites or it's just uh, symbolically they're Ishmaelites, if that makes sense. Right. I mean, because we know they're not Ishmaelites. They, they live in the same area. But the Bible is stating because they were Ishmaelites. Okay. Okay. So, because um, the Midianites are called Ishmaelites because they were the sons of Keturah, and Keturah was Hagar, the mother of Ishmael. If that makes sense. Okay. Genesis thirty seven twenty five and thirty seven twenty eight. Uh, Genesis thirty seven twenty five. They sat down to eat bread and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing the spicery, the balm, and the myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. Right. And then verse twenty eight. They're passed by Midianites merchantmen. And they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites <coughs> for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. So here you can see Ishmaelites and Midianites are used interchangeably. Or they're being combined, right? Right. Yeah, but they're just switching one to the other. They call them Ishmaelites, they call them Midianites, and then they call them Ishmaelites. Um, yeah, it, it, it's interesting, especially given the light from Genesis 37, 27. Yeah. Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother and our flesh and his brethren were content. So they're calling out Ishmaelites specifically in these verses. And now you have this crossover this combination of Midianites and Ishmaelites they're showing that the Midianites were merchants and as such as an Ishmaelite they sold Joseph as you would a 
say a piece of stoneware for 20 pieces of silver. So the golden earrings were identifying whether these are Midianites or Ishmaelites, but they're identifying them as some type of, let's say, merchant. So, and they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. So is this, is this some type of an offering? Is this some type of free will offering? What, what exactly are they doing here? Are they paying some kind of a tribute? I would, why would they would so willingly give up these earrings, this gold? I don't know. Hmm. What does the gold represent? I mean, Revelation 3, we're told to buy from him gold tried in fire. Yeah, well, it can represent character. Well, especially since character is also represented by a garment. So they spread a garment. They spread out the character and they cast every man the earrings of his prey. What should we be seeing here? I mean, we've got we've got multiple symbols. We have those that have heard a message that are now willing to support Gideon, the Gideon message. They have now spread out a garment and they have cast the earrings that were taken from the wrong message they are they're casting in here the method of support the method of economic support that had been withheld mm -hmm. in the past Does anyone have any other thoughts on this? What other considerations could we have? And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand 
and 700 shekels of gold, beside ornaments and collars or sweet jewels and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian and beside the chains that were about their camels' necks. 1,700 shekels. Now, we were trying to establish a while back the weight of, I think we, of the sanctuary leading to the shekel of, or, or the talent of the temple. And we never really did address that. But we have here a number, 1,700 shekels of gold. How could we look at this at this point? How would we translate 1,700 shekels into a method or manner of measurement that we would understand today? Well, that's because we're not really certain about how much a shekel weighs. There's different opinions. Okay, there's different opinions, but which one can we make use of at this point that would fit within the narrative that we're looking at? <sighs> well, I mean, because, I mean, you can put it into grams. There's all different ways in which you could do it. I mean, sometimes you'll say that, you know, a shekel is about 11 grams. I mean, if that is the case, 1,700 times 11 is 18720. But now, isn't that interesting? something like that anyway around there um it's just slightly over 11 grams if you did if you took 18720 and divided it by 1700 you just get over 11 grams but whether that's correct or not that'd be 11.0117 grams but nobody knows for certain, right? So, I mean, it could represent July 18, 2020 in some ways. I mean, okay, now it could be 18700, uh, depends on how you look at it. But yeah, so 1700 times 11 directly is 18700 grams if that's what so that's a symbol of july 18. whether that's correct or not i don't know okay i'm still working on the understanding these uh weights and measures but yeah you're going to have all different kinds of opinions in different periods of time and how much you know, a shekel was. So there's not any sort of straight, direct way to uh, to demonstrate that. Okay, now one of the comments from the chat would present Proverbs 25.12. As an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. I'd have to think for a while as to that and how we tie this back in here with Judges 826. So anyway, they have this 1,700 uh, shekels of gold. Right. Now there's also, besides the ornaments, the collars, the purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian, besides the chains that were about the camel's neck. 
So he's going to make this ephod. Um, well, the or, verse the verse states verse eight twenty seven. Yeah. And Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel went thither a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. Mm -hmm. So Gideon constructs an ephod. He takes the gold, he takes the jewels because he wants this direct communication with God. And the people of his sitting go a whoring after it. In other words, they are lifting this up as something to worship, right? Yeah. Now, the way that I apply this is I apply it to the prediction regarding the president of the United States. But um, that is, I would take it as uh, Colin's prediction and also Adilio's prediction. So you're applying the ephod in that manner. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Any any thoughts or comments on what he just what he just what Theodore has just presented? Yeah, it could be that. I mean, if 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 you want to be be uh, very, you know, pinpointing something, but I think it's just holding up our own own opinions above what God is showing mm -hmm. us. Those rising thing, we can make that an idol. And it's a it's a rejection of Miller's rules. It's taking yes. the truth. It's taking the truth that that we know to be true because it's been established. But then it's it's making an idol out of it. That is, it's it's making predictions. It's going against what we're actually being shown by the July 18th prediction. Because we see the same elements, you know, in in Collins' prediction and in Odilio's studies of the symbols of these numbers, which are correct. But the problem is the interpretation of them. Well, you know, around there puts truth mixed with error. And, and I would say it's mostly truth. The error is in some ways fairly minor. It's, it's gonna cause a disappointment for those who put their trust in uh, these predictions. But we've already been shown that we can't make predictions. And, and we need to accept that fact. We, we're supposed to be watching and waiting. We're supposed to be measuring the time. Because those those are an objective witness to the truthfulness of our message. But once we enter into a prediction, we enter into uh, an area that we are plainly shown that we can't do. We, we can't go there. Only after time has passed can we we properly interpret the symbols. So that's the way I look at this ephod. Well, what what about the method? What's that? Well, there was a, the Trump prediction. Yeah. We, were, we did predict that. And we were correct. Yes. Right. So, so we need to understand that we were correct already because we understood what J January 6th meant. And that we had to understand that that was in our line, just like the pandemic. It's something that existed within our line as a symbol. 
So, so we made predictions, but we didn't understand them completely, right? So, so we know that, you know, Jeff predicted the pandemic, for instance, and even the timing of it, though, indirectly, because he did, at the time didn't know that we would take November 9th and July 18th and mark them as midnight in the midnight cry, right? But he put the pandemic between those two, and definitely that's where the pandemic lies, and especially in connection with Trump. So all those things were correct. But then we, we say, well, we weren't correct because Trump still has to be the last president again. So now we have to get him to become president again, which would be basically be a denial that we were correct the first time. So, right. so that's the way that I, because we don't seem to understand our own history when we try to put Trump as president again. We're turning away from our own history. Yeah. And, and even if Trump became president again, you know, in 2024, he definitely is not going to be president in 2022. But even if he became president in 2024, it wouldn't be part of our prophecy because it would lie outside of the line that we were given, right? Because our line ended December 25th, 2021. And Odilio really showed all of that in dealing with the pandemic. So it didn't make sense to look beyond that to 2022 and what's happening with Biden as anything to do with the Trump prediction or this midterm election or even the election after that. Um, I just don't think that we really understood the lessons that we were being taught when we start making more predictions. Just uh, concerning um, mm -hmm. Odelio's study. Yeah. He had, he had entered just a number of 1,629. Yeah, yeah, which is important. And, uh, yeah, I actually found out from when Ezekiel begins to prophesy the siege, the beginning of the 390 days lying on his left side. Okay. Which is July 21st, 592. It's actually yeah. 16, 1629 days then <laughs> when the siege actually begins. Okay. Okay. So that's pretty fascinating. So... So what does that mean then? Because we we have our understanding of the siege, right? This that's the tenth day of the tenth month. Yeah. Well, I I, I thought about yeah I thought about adding because you have the three hundred ninety beginning then and you have the sixteen twenty nine. So if you add, if you add them together, it takes you to twenty nineteen, and so there you have the pandemic, which yeah. should be representing the siege. Mm -mm. Okay. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I, I would agree with that. So um, so I just want to show this to people because we're just we're kind of a bit over time, but I just want to uh, show this. So I'm going to share my screen. Stop. Can you, how do I do this? Can you stop your share there, Dwight? Dwight? Yeah. Stop your share. Okay. okay, so I'll make this a little bit bigger. So we're looking at, um, so 592, we have to go to, to July 21st on the Julian calendar. That's going to be the fifth day of the fourth month. Um, we have here on the Babylonian calendar, the fifth of Tammuz. Because uh, that's the calendar we're using actually in Ezekiel. And so then we're going to go, is it an inclusive count? No, it's just it's just an ordinal count. Oops, here, I'm going to get yes. this here. Let's do this again, save. So the number of days... <laughs> which is pretty fascinating. So the number of days then from when he begins his prophesying, that's Ezekiel 1, verse 1 and 2, 
it's going to be 1,629 days to the siege. So this is a number that Odilio derived from understanding the pandemic. Correct? Yes. And, and so it's definitely a valid symbol. But now you're going to have from this date uh, that the pandemic, or not the pandemic begins, but <laughs> the date of the siege, you want to add 391. Is that what you said? What were you going to do here? Uh, no, no. Oh, oh okay. From so, when? Where, where are you yeah, going to put so, 391? Well, I didn't say the 391, but I said oh. you have the 390. Oh, 390. That begins also, that begins also on that uh, 21st of July. Okay, so you're going to count on, yeah, so the 390 starts on the 21st of July. So, yes. so if you add yeah. so both of them dates, both of them spans together. That brings us to August 15th. But is that August 15th of no. 591? Yeah, August 15th, 591. Yeah. Okay. So he starts on midnight, and then he's going to begin the 40 days on August 15th at the midnight cry, right? So that's something we already had understood. Oops, I did that twice. Well, I'm, I'm asking only because you started that out in the fifth day of Tammuz of 592, Julian. Right. So that's going to be 390 days. Okay. Is going to bring me 365 plus 25 days, right? There's 25 days between, between July 21st and August 15th in Millerite history. Okay. So we're just doing three, uh, uh, we're doing 365 plus 25 is 390. So that's why from midnight to the midnight cry in Ezekiel is 390 days instead of just 25 days. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So um, Okay, so what else, Stephen? Yeah, so um, we had understood that. So just from that 21st of July as well, as I okay. said, 1629 takes us to the beginning of the siege. Right. And so what, what I did was just if you add 390, yeah. To 1629 is, is 2019. Oh, so you're just adding the two numbers. So that's all. You're not you're not putting them on the calendar. No. Per se. No, okay. Just, uh, okay. Yeah, so it's just oops. yeah, so we're just simply taking uh 1629 plus 390 equals 219. And that's going to bring us to 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 the to the to 2019, right? 1629 plus 390 equals 2019. Yeah. And that's gonna fit yeah. in then with um Odilio's starting the pandemic there in 2019 in November, right? Yes. And and it also ties ties to November 19th, 2019. Or November 9th, I mean, 2019. Yeah, so so we can see that this then is is correct. So and, and that's the thing is there's truth because I see Odilio, I, I don't see him as some kind of apostate or anything like that. And same with Colin. I just see them as making a mistake in how they're interpreting things because these numbers are giving them this information, they then say, well, we must come to this conclusion. But the conclusion doesn't actually come from the information that they have. The conclusion is, in my view, not even logical. It's, it's a denial of what we were actually being taught. So, so the numbers, in a sense, occur in a sort of a deceptive way, that is, we have these numbers and people are amazed by the numbers and say, well, they must be correct in their interpretation. But the numbers aren't actually giving them that interpretation. 
That's sort of been my argument. The numbers are there and they're a witness and they're correct, but the interpretation isn't drawn from that logically. There's no logical connection, in my view, to put Trump back into power based upon any of these numbers or spans of time, or to say that the pandemic now is, is going to develop into a Sunday law, you know, in some kind of a direct way. Okay, so any final thoughts there, Dwight, or anyone else? Not at this point, not for me. Okay. Okay, do you want to close with prayer then? Sure. Gracious Father in heaven, <clears throat> there is much light that is being presented. There is much that we are seeing within these symbols. We ask, Father, for your guidance so that we may correctly divide the word of truth to understand that which is important for us at this day. I thank you for those that have participated in all that was being addressed today. I thank you for those that have attended and that may view this later. Help us now as we prepare to go through our day for all of the things that you would have us to do so that your character is shown to those with whom we come in contact. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In all ways and in all things, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.